note things like uh like that return it's really nice there is no emergency drain pan that's one of the reasons we're not going to be doing any maintenance is because i don't want to take on that liability but we are going to open this up and inspect inside but before we get started we're going to do a little bit of house cleaning except the hand tray virus is a real thing and i'm sure there's other things to go with it so just for hygiene purposes we're going to clean this up first if you guys know a better way i am all ears what i'm doing is just spraying some disinfectant on this because i don't want it to get airborne so I'm trying to just disinfect and keep it to, as, as in place as much as possible. I'm not really trying to clean everything up. I'm trying to just stop that from getting airborne or, you know, slow it down. And got my gloves on. This is where you want to wear the mask. And because I don't want it to get airborne, I'm not using a brush. I'm not using a shot vac or anything like that. I'm trying to get as much of this bigger stuff as I can. So we already noted there was no emergency overflow pan, but we can see in the past it has been leaking water. This is existing. Here's where I sprayed the disinfectant. So before I disinfect this anymore, I just wanted to show that. Take a look inside of here. It is literally caked in there. So we're gonna note that. We can see all of this buildup in here. That's uh, that's slime in the summertime. So those are things that I definitely want to note. You know, we can see how the drain, it's all built up around where the drain goes. There's the drain hole. And then there's the drain line straight below. The good news is I don't see rat poop inside of here. But we can see right here it's been overflowing. So we do want to note all of that. And notice how the duct comes in. There's no return plenum. There's no way for that air to mix. So that means the air pattern is going to be in a more circular shape on the coil, which means the coil doesn't have the best heat transfer. So it's it makes the unit extremely inefficient. I'm sure it's a lot easier for the installer to do that, but it, it doesn't work as well. And we can see it's pulling attic air from every single one of these holes. And right here in the very, very center, it's the dirtiest. And then over here... On the very bottom edge, like see right there, it's you know fairly clean. That's because there's no airflow going through there. So it looks like it's a 1994 model coil. So that's impressive, guys. For this coil to be 31 years old, and that's the only amount of rust we have on there, that's, uh, yeah, I'm impressed. That's awesome. Safety first. Non-contact volts. We should be off, but we're picking up a little something. Let's check our voltage to see what we got. We're showing zero volts from line one to line two. Showing zero volts from line one to line two. I got zero volts from line two to ground and zero volts from line one to ground. So I don't know why it was a non-contact volt was reading. Looks like we are clear. Let's check it again. That's why I always carry two meters. Double check before I touch anything. Non-contact. It's beeping. Let's check our voltage. Zero volts. Zero volts. Let's put it in a smaller. All right, both meters said we had something, but both meters said we had no voltage. So, hey, we're good to go. That's 16 ohms. 16 ohms. 12.97. We're rated for 15. So it is out of spec. So is everything with this unit. So typically I don't ohm out the heat kits. Uh, this style I do though, because they're notorious for a failing. Take a look at the other side of the blower. A little bit of rust there. There's your motor. 3.40 amps, half horsepower. See that the motor's pretty dirty. See if we can see the windings. We just barely get a glimpse of the windings. I don't see too much oil leaking. There has been some. Let's 
All right, let's test uh, let's test a few basic things out. And only because there's such a rat infestation and touch things, I'm going to be using these tools uh, without without my uh, without my gloves. So go ahead and just put a little disinfectant on here. I got a clean rag in the truck. I'll use to finish that off with, but just to make sure we're not carrying anything back with us. And I'll also disinfect my meter down below. So it's a 40,000 BTU. So the outdoor unit is larger than the indoor unit. So that's gonna be a red flag. At 4.267, we got 14 on the Herm side. Right, so the compressor did not start. Well, so last night uh, the compressor wouldn't start up. We did have a bad run capacitor, dual run cap was bad. I didn't have one, came back the next day to put another one in, just threw a cheap one in there just so I can test the system, see what's going on inside. The only thing that sucks about the free version is that I have to go back in my profile and re-enter all that information again. If you opt for the subscription, it will save all this data to the site and you can pull it back up every time and compare it to your old data. Also, instead of using the Bluetooth of the meter, I find it's just faster for me to take the amps and volts and enter that in manually, uh, even though my meter does have that capability of doing it. Our superheat is too high. That means our we don't have enough liquid refrigerant in the evaporator cool. It's all boiling away too fast and giving us too much superheated vapor, which is why our suction line is also too high. Our subcooling, measuring the outdoor unit, means we have too much refrigerant stacked in the condenser. So we got too much refrigerant in the condenser, not enough refrigerant evaporator. That says we have a restriction. The restriction being that that metering device and indoor coil is a two ton and outdoor is a five ton. That's what's happening. So most likely somebody's removed charge out of the systems and actually still operate, even though it's not operating correctly. So when people say you can mismatch and it'll run. Well, yeah, it's running right now, but it's not running like it's supposed to. Here's where we use the true flow grid. That's where we use the true flow. It's measuring the actual airflow, 1044 CFM. This is our delta T. Some people say, oh, you got a 19 degree split, you're good. No, we're not good. The system is mismatched, it's not working right. So just because you're getting a 20 degree delta T doesn't mean you're right, doesn't mean you're good. We Here's our BTU capacity. The system should be moving 60,000 BTU. We're only moving 20, uh, 28,000 BTU. Sensible heat, that's 20,000 BTUs in sensible heat. Latent heat dehumidification, the condensation is coming out, 6,761. That gives us a sensible heat ratio of 0.75. So yeah, we can see that we're not moving the amount of heat that we need to. That's why your delta T doesn't mean that you're right. Doesn't mean that you're good. Obviously the delta T looks good here, but we can see that we're not anywhere close to what you're supposed to be. So that's why I like measure quick. It's giving you more numbers. You're looking at more of the system. It's doing a bunch of those old school calculations for us. So it makes it faster. Now, no, it's not as fast as beer can cold, but beer can cold was never accurate in the first place. Yeah, it's a lot faster than just measuring delta T, uh, but delta T you can see in this scenario isn't accurate anyways. So this system is a huge mess. It has a lot of problems. The outdoor unit is way too big for the indoor unit. So considering the size difference between indoor and outdoor and the condition of the indoor unit being 31 years old, the return duct is leaking, there's no return plenum, the blower's dirty, the evaporator coil is 31 years old, it's rusted, it's been overflowing, there's no emergency overflow pan. My recommendation is, hey, let's replace this system. It's working now, but let's replace this whole system and do it right so it'll last a long time.